Red Dawn, one of the most iconic action films in history, featuring a star-studded cast, intense action, incredible practical effects, and North Korea... Wait, that is the wrong Red Dawn. For those who don't know, there are actually two Red Dawn movies. The first came out in 1984, and the second one in 2012. If you have any sense of how movies work, then you can guess the second one is a lot worse, and you would be right. I have to say it is not a great movie. The first Red Dawn does a lot of things right that the 2012 one doesn't do well, and we'll get into that later. But this is going to be a bit of a follow-up to my last Red Dawn video, which is also my most popular video, but since it was copyright claimed, I can't make any money off of it, so here I go again trying to cash in this time with a bit less footage from the movie. Alright, so in this video we are going to basically be comparing how realistic these movies are, we're going to be comparing the world building that both of these movies set up, the invasion itself, and of course how plausible it is in real life, and what they draw from in the real world. So remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that fun stuff, follow me on Instagram and X, and let's just get right into the video. So for those of you living under a rock, the Red Dawn movies are basically about America getting invaded and then a group of high school kids named the Wolverines for their school football team become guerrilla fighters who create a resistance movement. As you may imagine, both of these movies taking place in different times, they have different adversaries that the movie envisions. Red Dawn from the 1980s is concerned about the Russians and their communist allies, whereas 2012 is also communists, but it is mostly focused on North Korea. Although, and this is an important point, the movie was originally meant to feature an invasion by China, and due to concerns that the movie wouldn't be played in that country, they changed all the flags and audio to reflect the invasion happening from North Korea in post. So let's look at the world building we get in the first Red Dawn. For both movies, we don't actually get a solid date of when they take place, so we'll assume they are contemporary with their release, in this case 1984, September of 1984. 84 was a very tense time in the Cold War. There was a period previously known as Detente, which saw the easing of relations between the USSR and the West, but this started to collapse by the late 70s. The collapse was largely colored by the many regime changes in the world in 1979. In the Western Hemisphere, four nations saw radical changes in government. Honduras was the most fortunate example with a coup d'etat taking place, although economic aid from the UN and US prevented the nation from falling into ruin, and Honduras would continue to be an American ally. Next door, both El Salvador and Nicaragua saw communist revolutions. In El Salvador, the US-backed dictatorship fought left-wing communist militia groups, while in Nicaragua, the Soviet-backed Sandinistas were able to take power, and another anti-communist rebel group, the Contras, would be backed by the US a couple years later. To the southeast, Grenada also had a successful communist uprising. All of this, understandably, was making the US very uncomfortable. In the same year, the Iranian Shah, an American ally, was deposed, and neighboring Afghanistan, which had become communist the year before, was in civil war, causing the USSR to directly invade. In Eastern Europe, the Pope visited Poland, inspiring a massive labor movement the next year, known as the Solidarity Movement, which would rise up before being repressed by the communist government for almost 10 years. In the early 1980s, US President Reagan and the UK Prime Minister Thatcher were strongly anti-Soviet hawks and were less interested in cooperation with them. By 1982, things only got more tense as the price of oil dropped. Oil exporting countries such as Mexico and the USSR suffered massive economic issues and Mexico actually came close to economic collapse. In the same year, the Soviet premier Leonid Brezhnev died, and he was replaced by Yuri Andrupov, the paranoid head of the KGB. The next year, 1983, saw two near misses from nuclear war. Firstly was Abel Archer, a highly realistic military exercise performed by NATO, which the Soviets thought may have been a false flag for invasion. A preemptive strike was averted thanks to the efforts from the spy Oleg Gordievsky, who informed the West of the Soviet concerns, allowing for them to clear the air. The same year, a nuclear missile site near Moscow had a false alarm, showing that American nukes were inbound. 
and only the judgment of the commanding officer Stanislav Petrov prevented a retaliatory strike. Of course, some people were concerned with all this brinksmanship, especially the Greens party in West Germany, who was just entering the Reichstag in this time in small numbers. Since Germany would be ground zero for any World War III, they had a strong emphasis on denuclearization and removing American nukes from the country. Okay, sorry for the long history lesson, then again, this is a history channel. Now let's actually look at what Red Dawn adds to this real history. First, the Soviet Union had its worst wheat harvest in 55 years. This 55-year mark is actually relatively accurate, and it was around this time a large-scale famine hit the Ukraine and Kazakh areas of the USSR in 1929 and 30. As we saw with the oil issue, the Soviet economy would be damaged by this point, and as such, it's possible that a bad harvest, coupled with a failing economy and international isolation, could push the Soviets to desperation. Then we see that labor and food riots break out in Poland, forcing a Soviet invasion. In our world, the Solidarity Movement wouldn't rise again until 1989, but with the failing food supply, it totally makes sense this could happen sooner. The Soviets invading is also possible, as they had invaded other neighbors like Hungary, Afghanistan, and Czechoslovakia previously, and almost invaded Poland in 1954 under less dire circumstances. Then, we are told that Cuba and Nicaragua reached troop strength goals of 500,000, but it's not specified if this is 500k each, or just total. We also see the El Salvador and Honduras fall, creating more communist regimes in the region and defeating American allies. Mexico was plunged into revolution, likely due to the oil economy failure, which would make the country insecure and likely ripe for communist revolution as well, and of course opening the US southern border. Then, the Greens party gains control of the West German parliament and demands a withdrawal of nukes from the country. In the aftermath of the 1983 close calls, this is understandable, although these close calls weren't really public at the time, although concerned elites in the country may have been aware of the able archer tensions. While the Greens in real life were only a small party, this wouldn't be the first time a small party comes to power quickly in Germany. We don't get too many details for the next point, but we learn that NATO is dissolved. My best bet is that some close call, maybe Abel Archer, spooked enough of Europe to sort of back off the whole nuke thing, and they lost interest in cooperation with the US. Although, what I think is more common, the US may have decided that the close calls in Europe were too much, and that it felt it would just rather stay out of the continent entirely and go back to isolationism. Either way, this whole situation leaves the US vulnerable, both politically and geographically, and the USSR is desperate, fighting two wars on its borders, finding itself unable to go on. Now let's look at the Red Dawn 2012 remake. Being centered in the modern day, many of us were alive when most of the world-building events the movie references happened, uh, but let's do a little history anyway. At the start of the millennium, the US was the sole world power, but problems still existed. Russia was fighting a civil war with Chechnya, a Muslim borderland that had been fighting through the 1990s for independence. An organization that I won't say the name of, because YouTube will call them AQ, had formed in the late 80s out of Afghanistan war veterans. After the Gulf War in 1991, where American troops entered the Holy Land of Saudi Arabia, the US became AQ's main target. In 2001, this culminated in the September 11th attacks, sending the US to war with AQ, who at this point was being sheltered by the Emirate of Afghanistan. The US invaded, starting a 20-year war. Two years later, concerns that Iraq had WMDs caused the US to invade that country as well, and they had already been striking them for over a decade since the Gulf War in 1991. From around this point, the movie starts to show us news clips, both real and invented, to paint the picture of the world. In 2008, the US economy went into recession, which had cascading effects around the world. The next year, Greece, already very unstable and part of the EU, had its own financial crisis. In the Red Dawn universe, the crisis spreads throughout the EU, especially in the South, and decimates the economy of the whole Union. Around the same time, the NATO alliance becomes fragile, although it's not specified why. If I had to come up with a reason, it would be a mix of the US being too headstrong and not consulting the wider international community on the Iraq invasion, 
coupled with European frustration at NATO's 2% GDP spending requirement on defense, which was a low priority for the continent at the time. Then again, even to this day, they're still not meeting it, so that's not a great reason, I suppose. We also learned that foreign actors had been found to be surveying the US computer systems that control the country's infrastructure, which is certainly realistic, and I'm not even sure if that is actually a fake clip or a real one. Another big development we see here is the creation of the Pacific Rim Cooperation Organization. Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan are all members, along with North Korea. But remember, the original movie featured China before being changed in post, so when it comes to North Korea, we'll also analyze it as China. Through the 2000s, Russia had become concerned with American meddling in world affairs and felt that it was overstepping or at least muddling Russia's own interests. This was true in Serbia in the 1990s, as well as Iraq. With the stands not being far from Afghanistan and close economic partners of Russia, it's quite possible that they would seek an alliance with Russia to prevent invasion or overthrow of their own dictatorships. North Korea joining a group like this kinda seems unlikely, since Russia would gain nothing from them, but China would make a lot more sense, although China was not as worried about American expansion abroad. We see North Korean shelling of Yeompyeong Island, a contested island between the two Koreas. In real life, this happened in 2010 and resulted in the deaths of 2 to 12 people, but it is unclear if this is the same instance or if this is supposed to be a later, more intense version. This was part of a steady increase in North Korean aggression. The same year, a North Korean torpedo hit the South Korean Cheonan warship, killing 46. Personally, I didn't actually know that this happened, and I was pretty surprised doing this research just how aggressive North Korea was being at this time. In 2011, Kim Jong-il dies and his son, Kim Jong-un, becomes dictator of North Korea. He is portrayed as a violent and unpredictable character, and it is noted that North Korea has the world's fourth largest army, which is actually surprisingly true. Around the same time, we see that there were massive attacks in Moscow, presumably carried out by Chechens or other Caucasus separatist groups, and in response, an ultranationalist party in Russia, likely the LDPR, comes to power. In response, Russia invades Georgia. It seems like they aren't really referring to the 2008 Russo-Georgian War, since the motive and nature are different, but it's worth noting that this did actually happen and it was a short war in 2008, largely to stop Georgia from occupying a contested area and from joining NATO. This Georgia War, however, seems to be more drawn out and happen later, with the Russians occupying Tbilisi, the capital, and America supporting rebel groups against Russia. While there are some attempts to diplomatically settle the issue, there is still strain. Due to the tensions in the world, the US also massively increases its military presence abroad, which did happen to some degree with surges in Iraq and Afghanistan, which one of the headlines comments is leaving the US exposed at home. Now, let's look at the invasions themselves that the movies explore. In both films, we have the wider invasion explained to us when the Wolverines make contact with American military men behind enemy lines. In the original, starting in September 1984, we learn that the first attacks and the ones experienced by the Wolverines were Soviet paratrooper drops disguised as commercial flights who secured key passes through the Rockies, including Calumet, Colorado, where the movie takes place. At the same time, Russian nuclear strikes attacked key American missile and communication points in the Dakotas, Omaha, Nebraska, Washington, D.C., and Kansas City, Missouri, all wiped off the map. It's worth noting that maybe the other big cities weren't hit because the Russians do actually want America for itself. It doesn't want to just destroy America, hence the invasion and not just the nukings. Saboteurs, who presumably had already infiltrated the country through Mexico, were mostly Cubans who infiltrated strategic air command centers in the Midwest and Texas. With American defenses down, the Cuban and Nicaraguan forces invaded the U.S. through Mexico moving up through the Great Plains to about Cheyenne, Wyoming, and across through Kansas. The U.S. forces were able to check their advance and hem them in between the Rockies and the Mississippi River. 
The Russians themselves sent three army groups through the Bering into Alaska. They cut the pipeline and moved through Canada in an attempt to link up with the main Hispanic force, but they were stopped, at which point the lines largely stabilized by the winter of 1984-85. Europe stays out of the fight, largely because they want to avoid a third world war. However, England and China have both joined with the US against the Soviets, but these allies seem to be having troubles. England, quote, won't last long, while China is believed to have lost around 400 million people, likely due to nuclear weapons. At first glance, it may seem strange that these countries would join, but it does make some sense for the time Thatcher's government was very strong against the communists and was friends with Reagan. At the same time, China, while communist, had been accepted into the world economy by the US, and they had an ideological split with the Soviets within communism, and so while they were both communists, they weren't really friends. By contrast, the 2012 invasion isn't as well thought through in my opinion. The invasion starts with an EMP attack that disables all electronics in the country, although it seems to leave cars alone, so that's a bit of an oversight. However, the North Koreans have some closed circuit communication system that allows them to operate in this EMP landscape. The next morning, dual airborne invasions start with the North Koreans parachuting into the Pacific Northwest, including Spokane, Washington, where the movie takes place. The Russians also do the same on the East Coast. Non-nuclear strikes take out other important installations as well, and the ground forces come in to actually occupy. However, the war on the coasts doesn't continue well into the mainland. The center of the country, roughly between the Rockies and Appalachians, is still the free United States. We also learn that the Wolverines have inspired resistance movements in Florida, as well as the Texas-Mexican border. It's also kind of worth noting, interestingly, that they almost mirror each other in terms of what land is taken, with the original Red Dawn having land taken in the center of the country, and the remake having the coasts being taken. Okay, so let's finally compare the two. It's worth noting that the very concept of Russia or anyone else invading the US is totally far-fetched, and really any plan to invade the US once it became a world power is just totally not feasible. Firstly, America has the world's most powerful military. Secondly, the country's geography makes it very difficult to conquer. There's the oceans on each side, so any invader that wasn't Mexico or Canada would have to cross those. If they did try to come from the north, northern Canada is not developed and very cold and rural and the south has a massive desert uh, with Chihuahua and Mojave, and further down there's just jungle and a very narrow isthmus. If you were to actually get to the US itself, the geographic features of the country still make it difficult to take. While most of the population centers are on the coasts, you can't get that far inland before hitting major mountain ranges, the Rockies in the west and the Appalachians in the east, you also have the Mississippi River cutting the country roughly in half in the Mojave and Sonoran deserts in the southwest. Even in the center of the country, which is mostly plains, the US could use the old Russian tactic of trading space for time, continually retreating and wearing the enemy down to exhaustion. Plus, anyone who invaded would still have to supply their military, something that would be very difficult to do over the entire ocean and through the aforementioned geography. But with that said, we're looking at how these movies stack up. I like the first movie more and it actually gives decent reasons for why the Soviets would want to invade the US and shows how the US was particularly vulnerable. The collapse of Latin America and potential for staging forces in the area actually chips away at the American geography defense and gives access into the more easily accessible Great Plains in the center of the country. Plus. This skirts the need for the Russians themselves to have to move a massive army across the ocean, instead relying on more local troops. The end of NATO and the lack of nuclear capability in Europe also makes the US more isolated and reduces their ability to strike Russia back. The famine in Russia and discontent in Poland, plus the ongoing issues in Afghanistan and with the oil economy, are also reasons the USSR might become desperate enough to invade the US 
especially when we consider that the part they control is actually the breadbasket of the country and they could use that to feed themselves. Still not a plausible thing in my opinion, given there is no way to mass an army on the US southern border without the US noticing, or to mass a Russian army across the Bering without us noticing, or for the US not retaliating nuclearly against the Russians. It's stated that nukes are out of the question for hitting America itself, since the Russians need the country relatively intact, and the US of course won't nuke itself, but there's no reason the US wouldn't nuke Russia back, even with a lack of nukes in Europe proper. But the 2012 Red Dawn is way less plausible. Russia really has no reason in this to invade the US at all. The Georgia proxy war and US interference in the region is the only reason given, but that's literally happening in the world right now, and it of course already happened a lot in the Cold War, and there was never any talk of trying to invade the US. You could, however, say that since the ultra-nationalist party was in power, they would be more likely to do so, but they already have a war they're having trouble finishing in Georgia, so why would they start another one? Plus, the Russians were somehow able to move all the way across the Atlantic and take over the whole eastern seaboard without anyone noticing that. Also, even if we say that NATO is dissolved, there's no way that Europe wouldn't just report on or tell the US that this was happening. At least the Russians had to invade the US through Alaska in the other Red Dawn movie, which is where they could feasibly kinda sorta get close and stage for an operation, at least on their own territory. Looking at North Korea, it also doesn't make much sense that they would invade the US. The Korean regime is all about survival, hence why they developed nukes. It wasn't so they could just destroy the world, it was so they could make sure no foreign power would ever overthrow them. But if you start a war of invasion against the US, then they have every reason to attack you and the regime is in trouble. Even if we look at China as the adversary, so much of China's power comes from the American economy and consumers, so using military force against them and destroying the US economy would only hurt China. So again, both of these are very unrealistic and there's really no way to make it realistic without first creating a very weakened America, as well as a much more powerful and proximate adversaries. For the pros of Red Dawn 2012, I'd say I like the opening presentation more. The original was just very straightforward and it just had text on a screen, but the remake actually had newspaper clippings and news stories, a lot of which were real, uh, which really gave a good sense of realism. I think the movie Threads does this better with radio and news in the background, and I'd love to make a video comparing Red Dawn to that movie as well, but when it comes to the 2012 movie, I still think the remake has its opening background exposition done a bit better, even if it was a bit harder to research because some of it was real, some of it was fake, and some of it was very close on the borderline. I also like how this remake worked more with urban warfare. At the end of the day, most people live in cities and most important stuff for controlling a country is in cities. The original movie takes place in a small Colorado town, the significance of which is that it's a pass through the Rocky Mountains, so more rural fighting there makes sense. But to fully unseat an enemy, you would need to be able to attack cities as well, and I think this movie shows that a bit more. I also think that the remake did a better job at weakening America with the EMP attack and gave some modest credibility to how an enemy could start to get a foothold without being totally destroyed. Also, I think that the newer one has better acting. Not great acting, mind you, but a lot better than the original. All that being said, I think the original wins out in most every other way, as we've kind of already discussed. While I still maintain that the acting in the movie isn't very good, uh, the story and themes it explores is so much better. This movie shows very interesting parts of Russian psychology and ideology, I talk about this in my other video, but we see how the Russians totally misunderstand parts of America, namely when they assume a sign commemorating natives actually is a dedication for bourgeoisie colonizers, and when they think the Boy Scouts is a paramilitary group. In the remake, the bad guys are just generic bad guys with no real motivations or personality, save for a short generic communism speech. The theme of the loss of innocence in war is also much more powerful in the first Red Dawn, 
We see, hold on here, there's some spoilers. Uh, we see them deal with betrayal especially, and we see how they deal with that in a very brutal way, and how the group kind of splits on how they want to deal with this sort of stuff. I also think Red Dawn does a better job at showing us some of the hopelessness of insurgency fighting. Even with successful insurgencies, the death rates are so much higher than that of the conventional army, and while there's a lot of plot armor, ultimately most all of the main characters end up dying, and the movie sort of follows a realistic emotional roller coaster of war. At first it's very patriotic and successful, rah rah and then people start to die, and they keep dying, and you realize there's only so much you can do, and maybe that you'll even lose. The remake, on the other hand, doesn't convey this as well. It has some main character deaths for sure, including Jed's death, which actually did catch me off guard, but the ending isn't as solemn, and the emotional struggle to start fighting doesn't seem as well done to me. I got a lot of flack for saying I didn't love Red Dawn on my last video about this, and, you know, fair enough that uh, I'm too young, I didn't grow up with it, and it's dated, especially for someone my age. Uh, I don't have the nostalgia attached with it, I didn't grow up in the, you know, Cold War. Uh, but I honestly really like the movie, but more in a retrospect. It's one of those where, while you're watching it, you remember its shortcomings with acting and plot armor and kind of goofy action. But the scenes that stick with you are the good parts, like the end scene in the park, the execution, the paratroopers coming from the sky, the air and tank battles. As for realism, the original wins on every front. It was a tenser time, it provides motive and opportunity for the invasion in a way the remake doesn't. It gives us more detail in world building. I'm sure part of this is just the timing as well. Like, the original Red Dawn came out at the peak of the Cold War, but the remake came in a much calmer period. Even today, with everything going on, I still think it's a lot calmer geopolitically than it was in the early 80s. So, now I pass the question off to you. What do you like and not like about both films? I'm sure the remake is going to get panned in the comments, uh, but I'm curious if there is anything you do like about it. Uh, but that's it for this video, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, follow me on Instagram and X, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.